Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Paul, and this is trying to things that I'm curious about and things to look into, I like share. So in today's video, we're gonna be doing uh, July's book review. Um, and with this, we go over the five books that I read this past month, or five of the books that I read this past month, and I will give you a brief review. And if you are interested in any of them, I will leave the title uh, down in the description below. And with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So with this first one, uh, it's called The Defining Decade by Meg J. Looks like this. It's about 250 pages. It says why your 20s matter and how to make the most of them now. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciated within uh, this book, uh, she's a psychologist who works with a lot of 20-somethings. And um, so essentially she put a book together talking about uh, common things that she goes over with each of them and saying like, okay, we got to start thinking about these areas of your life. One of them being work, like, okay, what do you want to do? What skills do you currently have? Where, where can we take these things? Uh, where can we go from here, right? Another one of them being love. That was a very interesting section, just talking about planning that out, uh, planning out when you want to get married, planning out uh, when you want to have a family and start starting to think about that in light of your other career goals, uh, in light of the biological clock that we all have. Um, that was a very interesting section. And then the last one was um, pretty much the brain and the body and just talking about how to manage your own emotions, how to manage uh, stress, anxiety, um, all these things that um, we essentially have to start dealing with on our own in the 20s. And so this was a very, very practical book, a uh, book filled with a lot of stories, a very, very easy read. If you know someone who is in their 20s and they don't, they're not, they haven't really thought a lot about the future, they're kind of just like enjoying the moment, you know, when we're young is when we're supposed to have fun, kind of that mindset, uh, this would be a, a good book to, to give them, that, that way they can read it and uh, hopefully start thinking a little bit about the future. Again, it was The Defining Decade by Meg J. Um, okay, so this next one, it's called The Adventure Capitalist by Jim Rogers. This book is 342 or 43 pages. Uh, this was a really, really cool book. I really enjoyed it in terms of uh, getting a different type of finance book, not just a technical book, not just one uh, filled with stories of how someone gained their own personal wealth, but this one was kind of like a journey around the world. And I think uh, he meant to kind of treat it like that, like in terms of writing it, it's kind of taking us on the adventure with him, but I want to show you this part. So this is here in the back, um, and this is a list of all the different places that he went over his three-year journey. And so that was pretty cool. But essentially, he gets his firsthand look at these different countries. Instead of hearing many, many different reports, he's going to these countries himself. He's talking with the uh, people there, uh, looking at their banks, looking at uh, their markets, looking at a lot of different things, right? Looking at their politics. And then uh, scattered throughout the book, he has different uh, tidbits of uh, investing advice. And so this was a fun book. It was uh, an insightful book. Obviously, different people are going to take different things uh, from this book, but uh, a very good read if you're interested in investing, especially investing abroad. So again, this is called The Adventure Capitalist by Jim Rogers. Okay, this next one. Yeah, let's do this one. So this next one is called Writing as a Way of Healing by Luis uh, DeSalvo. Looks like this. This one's 216 pages. I really enjoyed this book. I starred the, ever, so many things in this book. Underlined so many things. Um, so one of the things that I really appreciated that she did in this book um, was, so she brought together the academic side of things, meaning the PhDs and the MDs talking about trauma, talking about hurt, pain, all this sort of stuff. And then she brought together the artist's side of things. So she's, she talks about many different uh, authors and um, people of that type who have used creativity to heal or help heal uh, trauma in the past and to make sense of it. And uh, this is one that touches home to me because this is one that um, I feel like I'm personally on this journey myself as well. And just seeing how well she put together this book on, again, both on the academic side and then also pulling from real world experiences uh, was a great book and uh, a lot of helpful stuff in here. So not only does she go through each chapter uh, talking about the uh, her main point of the chapter, but then she'll each end each chapter with, okay, what can you do now? And then it has a whole list of questions. And then there was actually a part uh, here in the end that I wanted to talk about and it was pretty interesting. So she, also teaches and her students, she, she writes a lot about her students in this book as well. And she writes about 
the different type of narratives that we can form when we are trying to uh, recover and heal. And so there's three different types that she comes up with. Well, actually, I don't even think she came up with them. Um, yes, this was Frank. So it was from uh, Arthur W. Frank, uh, who's the author of The Wounded Storyteller. And he identifies uh, three major types of wounded body narratives. It's called the chaos narrative, uh, the restitution narrative, and the quest narrative. And then she goes in, and this is on page 195 through 200. Yeah, 200, 201. Um, but essentially, it was very, very interesting because the chaos narrative, she was talking about it. I just talked about, okay, the chaos narrative um, are difficult to hear and threatening to readers. This is especially so in a culture that insists on happy endings. Uh, that believes people can always find a triumph against adversity and thinks that something good can always be arrested from, tra from tragedy. Uh, because chaos narratives have their source in extreme anxiety and deep pain, they often elicit these states in the reader. And so this is with the chaos narrative. And then what she says here is, uh, when the writer of a chaos narrative desires, says Frank, is for the reader to recognize the states of chaos exist. If the wounded body narrative is told retrospectively, the writer wants the reader to understand that the narrator has survived times during which chaos prevailed. So there's one type of narrative, right? And then um, this was kind of this was kind of interesting too. I I uh, underline this part right here. And again, I'm I'm going deeper into this book because this is probably one of my favorite ones out of all of them, uh, or maybe just one that hit home. Not necessarily my favorite, uh, but maybe. Anyways, um, this is an interesting thing with the chaos narrative. So it says, this is from one of her students. I know you don't want to hear this you said, but it's the truth and I have to write it. Everyone wants to hear how if you're abused, you survive and you triumph over the evil of your childhood, but until now I haven't. This is my life right now. I'm not proud of it, but it's true. Some of us don't escape. Some of us continue the patterns of our past and this is the story I have to tell. And I thought that was really interesting and interesting as well. I was like, man, this person's even talking about, look, I'm not even proud of where I'm at. I'm actually kind of continuing a lot of these pattern, patterns that I observe. But as a way of storytelling, this is what I need to tell right now. So then uh, they go into the, uh, she goes into the restitution narrative. Um, let's see, what can I summarize here? All right, let's just take this one a little bit. Um, Many wooden body narratives take on the assumptions of restitution narrative and critique them to expose the underlying fallacies of how our uh, culture understands bodily ills. The narratives of such and such and such and such, for example, expose the fallacious assumptions that some people have with incurable illness aren't normal, they can't be happy, a lot of different things. Uh, they articulate to how simple descriptions of bodily appearance and bodily functions challenge our culture's tendency to hide from the realities of life. An important part of wooden body narratives is to demystify the life of people living in wounded bodies. So that was a very, very uh, interesting thing as well. Essentially saying, okay, if culture has this one view of how uh, we should live in our bodies, and this is saying like, look, some of us live in a very, very different body uh, with, with different pains. And so this one's kind of that restitution narrative. And so then this last one is the quest narrative. And again, I, I know I'm taking more time on this one, but this one is the quest narrative. Um, and this is one of the things that I, Loved about this one. Okay. Um, sometimes illness launches people into writing. Writing for many, uh, for many writers who's never, who've never written before, the, uh, before illness often feel like embarking upon a quest for life's meaning or one's personal history. Uh, facing mortal in the illness, people often feel that they must review their lives and establish a symbolic meaning for them, creating perhaps, um, as Audre Lorde did, a biomyth. Myth Myth, mythography, mythography, uh, a life story with mythic dimensions. And so that was very interesting as well. So the quest type of narrative is one that, you know, creates these mythic dimensions within your life and make you think of your life in terms of symbolism. Okay, what do these things mean? So anyways, there was a lot of good things in this book. Um, sorry if I butchered any of that uh, in reading any of that. But there was a lot of good things in this book. So if you have thought about writing at all, if you've suffered any type of hurt in the past, um, I've, I've, I've talked about James Pennebaker's book, uh, Opening Up by Writing It Down. I've talked about uh, a few other books as well that I know I'm beginning to read on this topic as well. So essentially, forming narratives out of your life story, this is a great book.
Again, writing as a way of healing, 216 pages. Okay, I'll save this one for last. Let's go over this one. Uh, Gentle and Lowly, uh, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers by Dane Portland. Uh, this is what this book looks like. This book is very, very popular right now. Um, at least it seems to be very, very popular right now in different Christian circles. Uh, this one is about 213 pages. Um, and my goodness, if, how would I talk about this one? If you know someone who's perhaps very, very, um, they like to preach the judgment of God, right? They, they see that as God's main thing or the wrath of God. This book does a great job at just talking about Christ being gentle and lowly. And yes, it does bring up, yes, Christ does have that side, but like what's his, what's the core of Christ's nature? What is the core of Christ's nature? Is it this harshness and wrath and judgment or is it this gentleness, lowliness, um, grace, and uh, all these different things, not to say um, anything about that conversation per se, but this is what uh, Dane enters into with this conversation. And over 200 something pages really, really lays out Christ's heart for sinners and sufferers in a really, really gracious way. Uh, and I would say in a really comforting way too. I know a lot of people who um, they kind of judge themselves really, really harshly and maybe push themselves away from the church as well. Um, Whereas Christ is all along saying, hey, come, 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 come. So I felt like this was a really, really good book. So if you know anyone who's maybe really harsh on themselves or maybe really legalistic, anything like that, uh, this would be a great book uh, to have them read as well. And maybe if you yourself struggle with your own judgment, pick up this book. That's gentle. Okay, this last one. Uh, I cannot recommend this author enough uh, on leadership. He is my favorite. Uh, of course, there's John Maxwell as well. And he's really... He's, he's probably my second favorite, and he's, he's tremendous as well, but Dr. Miles Monroe, I, I love pretty much every book that this guy uh, has, but this one is called Becoming a Leader, right here. It looks like this, and this one is 244, about 250 pages. Um, I really, really, really like this book. I wanted to read you guys a quote from this book. Um, here at the beginning here um but essentially one of the things that i love about this book was and he has this with all of his books but he's pulling the principles straight from uh the bible and uh expands on them greatly um look like just this first one in the introduction great leaders do not desire to lead but to serve and okay so I wanna begin with this one right here. Okay, a good leader not only knows where he is going, but he can inspire others to go with him. That's, that's good. It, it is in this environment that we stand as stewards of this age. We must face the challenge of developing, training, releasing, reproducing a generation of leaders who can secure the future for our children and their children. So there's this idea in the Bible of uh, being a steward over what God has given you. And, from the get-go, one of the things that I love about him in this book is his idea of developing leaders. And in light of developing leaders, he's developing the reader, which and in this book is called Becoming a Leader. And he's saying he's doing this because as stewards, he's saying as stewards of our body and of the church and of our gifts, we also are stewards of the age in which God places us to be born. And so if we have been born at this time, we are stewards of this age. And so if we have the faith, we are to be stewards of it. And how are we to be stewards of it? By uh, not only developing the leader within ourselves, but also developing others to be leaders. And from the get-go, this is one of the things that I loved about this, because from the get-go, he's essentially saying, we need to be a steward of this, and we need to develop others. And then a leader desires to serve. And then a leader is one who not only can uh, you know, have his vision and have his goal, but he can inspire others to go along with him. Uh, or with them. These can be, you know, women too. Like there's plenty of amazing women leaders out there as well. So it's not just, um, definitely not just for guys as well. I was just saying him um, probably out of habit. Um, but like even this, I'm just flipping to a random page. The purpose of leadership is to inspire every follower to become a leader and to fulfill his potential. Maybe I'm using his because he uses his. Uh, the ultimate goal of true leaders then is not to perpetuate followers, but to help to create other leaders. The purpose of leadership is to inspire every follower to become a leader and fulfill his potential. The true leader measures his success and effectiveness 
by diminishing the degree of his followers' dependency on him. The less they need him, the more dependent he is. Like that is that is just some that is some really, really solid stuff. So you're not you're not praising yourself because you've got a bunch of followers. You're saying, all right, have I developed people? Where are the leaders? And then if I were to go right now, are my followers like all the people who are following me right now, are they dependent on me? So if I left, they would, you know, be in shambles, or have I developed them to the extent that they could begin to lead uh, themselves as well? And so Again, those, that was three quotes, even just from one random page that I uh, flipped to. So there is a lot of gold in this book, and I would highly, highly recommend this book if you are in a leadership position, if you see any leadership for your life uh, or any potential, or maybe there's the smallest little seed in you that goes, maybe I want to become a leader, and I don't know where to uh, begin. So this was Becoming a Leader uh, by Dr. Miles Monroe. Uh, again, just about 250 pages. Gentle and Lowly, about 213 pages by Dane Portland. Writing as a Way of Healing, 216 pages by uh, Luis DeSalvo. Uh, Adventure Capitalist by Jim Rogers, about 343. And then The Defining Decade by Meg J. So that is this month's book review. If you have read any of these books or if any of these sound interesting to you, let me know down in the comment section below. With that being said, I will see you guys next time.